before we say, well, we wait till we have a hundred viewers until we. Uh... <laughs> no, that's that's too. No, much. we have no. Okay. Um... Go on. <laughs> Great. Hello, everybody. Welcome again to the Friends of Trunk uh, video educational um, podcast. You say or vidcast. Um, and today we've actually got we've got a sort of Champions League final of um, data analytics people. Um, we've got William Spearman here from from Liverpool. We've got Javier is back, and I know he's got a big uh, fan club. Javier Fernandez from Barcelona, and then we've also got Suds here from Benfica, um, and. As well as that, myself and Laurie are, are, are representing the more academic world. Um, and today we're going to talk about tracking data. And I'm actually going to start by just going through the, the three guys who work or are employed by clubs and ask them a little bit about how they use tracking data in what they do. And so I think I'll, I'll just get started with SUDS um, and you can give a little background and how you use tracking data in in everything that you do. Yeah, um, so tracking data for us has been the mainstay for about eight, 10 years now. So it's nice to have data from even 2013, 2014 onward. So a lot of information that we can use tracking data for is um, identifying context. So we know passes happen from event data, but we would like to know maybe potentially does the pass stretch an opponent in a certain way. And this sort of information we can solve through having uh, tracking data for us and the opponent. Um, on top of that, uh, we also get information in terms of understanding, you know, how good a dribble is. Um, is a dribble actually, or can we define a successful dribble as something that is a touch that happens where a player can actually still control the ball and perform a next action from it. So is every touch in the player's dribble still within that player's action radius? Um, and I think that's really the, the two main things is trying to understand uh, what sort of control does a player have on the field, which I think Javier and Will, uh, Will can speak to more regarding pitch control, and then um, understanding what are the behaviors of the opponent relative to the actions that we do on the field. Are we successfully able to stretch opponents? Are we successfully able to create numerical advantages in uh, corridors? And the sort of information we can get from tracking data. Cool. How, how much would you say, what proportion of your work involves tracking data? And what proportion? I, I, I was very impressed when I heard you talk in Barcelona because you were using tracking data, you were using event data, and you were even using a minutes played data, so sort of plus five minus models. So what, what proportion would you say uses tracking data? Uh, so tracking data is at the moment only used for the first team. And I think I mentioned this in earlier talks is that we focus on first team academy uh, across tactical analysis, load monitoring and other things. Um, so for me personally, I maybe don't get to spend as much time with tracking data as I'd like to, but I'd say maybe somewhere around 35, 35% or so of my time is Data. That's great. And um, I'll move on to you, Will. Um, your background, your research background, or when I first met you at the Opta Pro Forum, you were already working intensely with tracking data and you've written a couple of the most seminal papers in this area. And so how, what have you been using it for when you've, when you've arrived at Liverpool and what sorts of things are they interested in, in using tracking data for? Yeah, so <clears throat> like you mentioned, before I came to Liverpool, I worked almost exclusively with the tracking data. So I hadn't done that much work with the event data or event data modeling um, before that. And most of my work was around space control, tactical analysis, using that space control and kind of evaluating uh, dangerous moments, you know, getting context around um, around a given game state using that additional information from the tracking data. Um, and Liverpool, they brought me in to kind of continue working in the same vein. So I'd say about 90 to 95% of my work is based on, you know, answering questions that you can really only answer with tracking data. Hmm. No, that's really good. And uh, Xavier, you also have written quite a few research, um, research papers using tracking data. 
and that is your primary interest. Is that what takes up most of your time working at Barcelona? Yeah, I think that for us, the, the most important thing is to try to, uh, to quantify the performance in, game, in, in terms of our game model and trying to really understand the way we want to play as much as possible. So for that, tra tracking data has been very useful because um, it does provide you lots of information regarding the context. So what's happening in every, in, at any time during the match uh, and for Barcelona uh, um, play, uh, playing style, and this is probably valid for every team, but in our case especially, it's very important to know not only what you're doing on ball, but what you're doing off ball. So that's why uh, tra tracking data has been very useful for trying to really get a grasp on uh, how do we quantify the things that we know are important uh, to happen during the match. And, either for player development or for evaluating just a team performance. However, I mean, I, I never see tracking data as like a separate thing of event data, because basically when you work with tracking data, you will have all you will need to integrate uh, event data so, so you can actually have like um, a more detailed, uh, you know, uh, set of on ball events. So basically working with tracking data is also working with event data, but to make it the answer short, I think it's probably 50, 50, 50% mm. 50 of things that we can do with the tracking data we have that is not much. And the other 50% is basically based on event data or on, you know, tax made by the analysts. I think um, for me personally, I'm, I'm a Liverpool fan personally, but for me personally, I, I I think Barcelona most kind of tracking data orientated type of football. And that was very clear that you thought from a, an early stage that you had to work with tracking data because you're very interested in the geometry of the game at a, at a very fundamental level. And that seems to be a sort of part of the philosophy of the club that, that it was when tracking data became available that, that analytics became more interesting. Is that, is that a true observation? Yes, uh, pro probably the thing is that when you when you ask coaches and game analysts of what what is interesting for them, uh, typically the answer has to do with more than one player, and uh, more often than not, it has to do with the player that doesn't have the ball in that moment. So that basically takes you to the point of if I want to, I mean, it's not about tracking data for the sake of tracking data. It's, what kind of data I need to answer the kind of questions are being interesting now for them. And it comes up that a, a, a very high percentage of those questions can be solved with tracking data. So it's, it's correct from your perspective. I mean, what, what, what you said, but um, I think it has to do more with the things you want to actually answer that the, that the actually, you know, tracking data per se. Yeah. Mm. Great. So I wanted to get the, the, the analysts in really early on in this discussion, um, just to give you some feeling for how important tracking data really is now. But what I'm going to do now is switch focus back to the academic world, although Laurie has been working a lot together with clubs. And he's going to present a few slides about basically giving an idea about what tracking data is, and also highlighting the steps we've come to so far in the course and how we're leading up and building up towards, towards using tracking data in the course. So I'm gonna hand over to Laurie to give a presentation. And um, well, go ahead, Laurie. Great, um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, let me know when you, can, uh, when you can see the slides. So is that working? Yeah, that's working good, yeah. Great, um, so I'm going to start with the with the second thing. Um, so the um, just to kind of go through where we've got to on our friends of tracking tutorials. Um, so sort of besides these live Thursday sessions, um, David and and more recently I have been putting together um, sort of a set of tutorials that help provide an introduction to to working with um, uh, fo football data, um, both tracking and and event data. Um, so there are now four, uh, four videos up online. Um, you can find them by searching for Friends of Tracking uh, channel on YouTube. Um, and in the first three, David kind of went through step by step all the things that you need to have in place to get going. So 
in part one, he went through sort of an introduction to data science, um, went through some of the tools that are available for analyzing data, um, focusing on um, Python and R, uh, and specifically going through some of the important Python packages that people in the community use. Um, in part two, um, there's a bit more of a focus on programming in Python, um, so a little bit on introduction to Python, but also a first look at, at working with some, um, some real football data, uh, in this case, the, um, the, the World Cup data that um, StatsBomb um, very kindly made publicly available. Um, and so this is event data, and, um, and we'll come to a little bit further on the sort of precisely what we mean by event and tracking data. Um, in part three, David went on to um, to focus on visualizing uh, the data, and I think you know this is obviously not something that's just limited to um, to the world of sports analytics, but the ability to um, present uh, and communicate data in a an informative and an appealing way is obviously crucial to the success of many analytics endeavors. Um, so David went through the um, the you know the basics of, of of plotting pitches, of finding shots in the um, in the stats bomb data, making shot maps and pass maps uh, of the style that you you may have seen um, online and uh, shared on Twitter. And then um, in part four, which we posted up today, we, we introduced a new data set. Um, this is a uh, a set of two sample matches that Metrica Sports have very kindly made available. Um, and, and this data includes not only event data for two matches, but also tracking data. Um, and so in part four, we've gone through some of the, um, some of the tools that you need to, to read in this data and to manipulate it in Python, and then looked at um, sort of how you can combine tracking and event data to get a sort of a bigger picture of what's going on uh, key moments uh, in a game. Um, and so we've been building on alongside of this a, uh, a code repository, which you can find at GitHub at the link here. Um, the Metrica data they've made available on their own repository um, in the third link here, and the StatsBomb data um, that David has presented pre previously you can find here also. So, I mean, along these sessions, you'll hear us talking a lot about event data and tracking data and the differences and how they complement each other. Um, so we thought it would be worthwhile just kind of revisiting exactly what the differences between these two data sets are. Um, so first of all, starting with event data, um, and this is something that's been collected now for, um, for well over 20 years. Um, and essentially event data is a, is a log of every um, on ball action um, during a game. So every pass, uh, tackle, shot, interception, as well as um, uh, disciplinary events and, and various other things. Um, and then for each event, you tend to have information about where it occurred on the field. So the location of, of the player that was making a pass, um, the location of a player that was receiving a pass, and the time in the game in which it occurred. Um, but it focuses very much on things that are happening to the ball. Um, and so uh, typically, you get about a few thousand events per match. And the example of what a shot might look like in the data is shown in the little field below. So you'll um, you'll get the location of the shot, you know, where it ended up. In this case, it goes in the goal, um, the player, and then some sort of secondary data, such as, you know, which foot did the player use to take the shot? Um, did it come from, what, who was the player who provided the assist? Was it across? And so on. So the event data is a very rich data set, um, but it doesn't include information about players who are not interacting with the ball. And that's why, you know, I think that's why tracking data has really kind of come to the fore over the last decade. Um, you know, everyone that watches football is aware of the importance of off the ball movements. Um, and this is what tracking data now allows us to start to study. Um, and with the tracking data, essentially, we get almost a continuous measure of where every single player is on the pitch uh, at any given moment of the, of the, um, of the game. Um, observations of player positions are, 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 are taken 25 times a second. Um, so you've got very rapid measurements that allows us to measure not just player positions, but also, you know, where they're running, so their velocity, um, their acceleration, sort of other key physical parameters. And, you know, a lot of the work that people, you know, especially uh, Sirs, Javier and Will have done is, is trying to, to look at how to, um, how do you build tools that allow you to extract sort of key bits of information from this. And so this same goal here is, um, this is what it would look like by combining the, the tracking and event data. So um, now, of course, you have the positions of all the players at the moment the shot was taken, uh, and the little arrows show you um, where they were running at that moment as well. 
Um, so what we thought we would do is just to kind of highlight the, um, the perspective that these two data sets give you on a game is to kind of run through a short video clip um, this is a, a goal that um, Toronto FC uh, scored um, in the last uh, last season. Um, so I'll get this running and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, so what you're going to see now is um, this is the start of the possession sequence with the goalkeeper. Uh, there's a number of passes um, and you know, ultimately it will result in um, Toronto scoring, scoring a goal. Um, so I'm going to play this through now, and then what we're going to do is look at, you know, what would this goal look like uh, from the start of this sequence in the event data? Um, what would it look like in the tracking data? And what kind of insights can you gain from the tracking data? Um, um, so David, should I read on that again, or was it, was it quite laggy, or was it fairly smooth? It looked pretty good. I was just going to cheer the goal, actually. It was a very nice goal. Yes, yeah, yeah. It was, it was carefully picked to make it nice. <laughs> Um, okay, in that case, I won't run it again, but move straight on. Um, so this was what the goal would look like um, in the event data. So each solid arrow indicates um, a pass um, and the final shot as well. And then um, the dash lines indicate a period where the player essentially dribbled or carried the ball. And, and often these, you know, the, these aren't necessarily indicated in the event data. Some providers do, others don't. Um, so, you know, we know that the ball moved from one, the pass ended here and the next pass started there. So we assume that the player um, carried the ball from one location to the other. Um, and so you can get some idea of, you know, how the ball was played across the field. But of course, you can't see how um, the runs that the, the players were making um, and, um, you know, how perhaps how the opposing team was, was attempting to retrieve possession or how it was manipulated out of play, out of, um, out of position. Um, so here's a movie from the tracking data uh, from this uh, goal. I've sped it up a little bit. Um, and so now, as, as, as you can see, we have, we're measuring the positions of all the players. Um, and so and by combining the, the event data and the tracking data together, we can start to get now a very rich um, perspective of, of what was going on. And, and just to provide an example of you know, one of the tools that, that, that people like um, that Will and Javier have been developing um, is the notion of, uh, of pitch control. And so the idea, how much control does either team exert only over any given specific position on the field? Um, and that's sort of quantified by the question, if the ball was played to that area of the field right now, would the team in possession, what is the probability of the, the team in possession would uh, retain possession of the ball, or the um, the probability the the team that's defending uh, retrieve poss possession of the ball. And so, like you can see in this plot, this is an example of a pitch control map. Um, the red regions indicate the regions that are controlled by the um, by the uh, the team in possession. Um, the ball is this gray dot right here. Um, so this is towards the end of the clip that we just saw. And then the blue regions are the the, um, the areas controlled by the defending team uh, here. And so the idea is if the, if the team in possession plays the ball into a red region, they're very likely to retain possession of the ball. Um, but if the team plays um, the ball into a blue region, then they're very likely to lose possession of the ball. And so we can begin to get an idea of sort of how much territory a player is capturing by off the ball runs. And if I play this forward as a movie, you can see this example very clearly. Um, so this player up here is the player that creates, that provides the assist for the goal. And you'll see that as he turns and accelerates into space, he captures the area that the ball goes into um, that ultimately creates the opportunity for the goal. Uh, and again, the little arrows show how fast the player is running. So this will replay. So you can see that he captures a huge amount of area that makes the pass possible. Um, and, and so it's tools like this that start to, um, that start to create the opportunity to to evaluate, to quantify the value of player actions um, off the ball, as well as the value of you know, on-ball actions like passes and, and so on. Of course, there are, there are plenty of challenges. Laurie, can um, I just stop you before you go on to the challenges? Um, yeah. I think we're just going to go over to Virginia and look how she's put some notes uh, down of these things before we discuss the, the challenges. So if you take your screen share off, yeah, I think you have to do that. 
and we're going to um, we're going to do this. Has she disappeared? No, no, she is. She's there. Oh yeah, there she is. Okay, good. So look at that. You've had your notes taken. That's the uh, discussion beforehand, and uh, notes taken on everything that we've um, everything that you've done so far, which you did at pretty high speed, I think. So um, update on how we use tracking data, uh, how the different different teams use it. We've got half a page. Well, we've got one page of notes, so we're going to fill up the rest of the page with with some more notes now. Great. So Laurie, you're going to now give a couple of um, you're going to give a couple of discussion points, which we're going to going to go through. I'll, yeah. I'll go back to you and allow you to to um, share your video. Right. So this back to um, back to the slides. Um, so all of us that work with tracking data, you know, face um, a number of challenges and and of course, um, analysts who work in clubs, you know, face the, the very, you know, the big challenge of converting tracking data in its raw form to, um, you know, decision, actionable information that can influence major decisions that their clubs are making. Um, so I'm going to kind of step through some of the challenges of, of working with this data. Um, and then we'll kind of, after each one, we'll kind of put it to the floor and, and get um, Javier, Suds and, um, and Will to sort of gain their perspectives on it. So. So the first challenge is, you know, the difficulty of, of, of simply obtaining this data. Um, it's generally not available for purchase, um, or at least, you know, the data for other leagues other than the one that you play in is, is not available for purchase, which, which means that, um, you know, even if you do have, you know, models that allow you to extract, you know, very big and innovative insights um, from the data, you know, there's a challenge to applying it for so things like recruitment and scouting because it's still very difficult even for clubs to get data for other leagues. Um, so, um, you know, I thought maybe that we could sort of go ahead and, and to discuss a little bit about this issue, data acquisition and the challenges that you faced and, and where you think that might be going in, um, in, uh, in the next few years. Um, so maybe I'll just pick on, um, on Javier first to, uh, to come up with some thoughts on that. Oh, am I am I am I still mute? You're you're on, Javi. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I unmuted you. Uh, you got picked on first. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't following that. Actually, was reading on YouTube. Can you <laughs> repeat the answer, Laurie? That's that's the the truth of the lecture. Okay, that, that's a fail. We'll we'll pick on Will first instead. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Javier, the question was just uh, so we were, one of the challenges we were pointing out was just like the difficulty of getting hold of tracking data. And, um, and, and, you know, and obviously that can limit its applications for things like recruitment and scouting. Um, so I guess we're just asking for, you know, the thoughts of, of, you know, the three of you working at clubs as to sort of what you found, you know, how this has limited its uses and how you think that that might change over the next, um, you know, the next few years. Yes, I think that's something that is that is that comes quite obvious is that when you're when you're st starting to do things and I mean just to say something before what we basically try to do with event with uh, tracking data is to enhance on ball events first and then you can also generate uh, events or identify patterns that happen off ball but the first thing is to at least well well, well having on ball events is to try to enhance that and increment the the amount of information that you can generate around that event so definitely it happens something that is when when you don't have that the availability of tracking data and you try to analyze this the same the similar kind of things and try to say something with that it does look like incomplete now right and, and if a game analyst or a coach is used to get information of some kind of level, and then you, for some other teams, you just cannot, you only can provide information using event data, it seems uh, incomplete. But also, the thing is that I think uh, something that is repeated very oftenly when people ask about, for example, uh, analytics in basketball is that 
everyone also wants to get tracking data and do things. And the common answer I hear from that is you can do a lot with what they call play by play data. So basically event data. So I do think that with event data, there's lots of things, very interesting things being done right now. So this is just for people that just can get event data right now. And uh, the good thing is that now you have uh, companies like stats pumps and others uh, providing this information. Uh, I think you, you you can get a lot from that, but basically just saying so, something extra, I think that the future of, you know, better understanding of the game is really having more open tracking data for most leagues and for most teams, but that's, that's something hard to have. Um, <clears throat> I can take a crack. So just kind of like what Javier was saying, I think there's a very good point that regardless of the data you're working with, it's going to be an approximation of reality. So coming at this kind of from a physicist perspective, um, you know, you can look at a game from different levels of data. So like if you just see the score, that tells you something about what happened at the game. If you see the number of passes, that tells you something about what happened in the game. If you see the procession, possession percentage, then when you start looking at the actual, you know, kind of on ball event data, that tells you a lot more about what's happening in the game. Once you add the tracking data, that adds a lot of context. But even there, there's still something that's missing. Like you don't know necessarily without body pose estimation, you know, what foot a player is on. So if you know you're building a model with the tracking data to evaluate passing for example you may see you know somebody who appears to be open to receive a pass but because of the foot they're on they're actually not you know or due to the weighted the weighting of the pass you know and the the position of the body they may not be able to receive that so even at that level of what we kind of look at right now as you know very difficult to obtain to do public analysis, even at that kind of very high level of data, there's still information that's missing. And some of that information you can kind of intuit from the event data in, 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 in kind of clever ways. So one of the difficulties of working with the tracking data is both kind of viewing it as an augmentation to the event data, but also using that event data to add context to the tracking data that you know, if the tracking data were more perfect, if you had the body pose, if you had like finer levels of granularity, you could get from that data itself. But kind of no matter what sort of data you're working with, there's going to be limitations. And, and a lot of modeling um, is about quantifying that uncertainty um, in a way that allows you to kind of aggregate information. I think I, I just want to jump in there because I think that both of your answers is is really interesting from my point of view as a mathematician because what you really need is an understanding through a model and it's not always about more and more and more data and it's interesting both of you take up first of all that you can't just answer questions by having more and more and better and bigger and bigger data that you really need to sort of understand what's going on. Yeah. Right. And I think, you know, if you're a lot of times when I'm approaching a problem, you know, like when I first started working with tracking data, a lot of times the thing I like to do is kind of build something with event data and then see if I can kind of build the same thing with the tracking data. Because mm -hmm. if you can't, then you've got some fundamental issues. And a lot of times it'll let you realize the issues you have with your data. So for example, one of the first things I did with one of the tracking data sets I worked with was build an expected goals model. And, um, you found some weird things. So this is a great way to kind of do data exploration that I think is really important um, because there was a, um, a lack of synchronization be between the events in that data set and the tracking data. You would actually a lot of times find that shots that resulted in goals would be synchronized with the event because um, there was no ball data in this source. They'd be synchronized with the moment in the tracking data after the goal had been scored. So the players would be in the corner celebrating. Mm. And you would end up finding some very weird parameters with your expected goals model. Like if the angle is kind of wider, uh, super, super wide, then the probability of goal of a, of a shot resulting in a goal goes up because of this lack of synchronization. So obviously there's ways to fix it, but without kind of digging in, without starting from first principles, you're going to end up with some very weird things. Just to kind of jump, uh, you know, jump in on that bit, um, you know, you're talking about sort of finding events in the tracking data, you know, not using the event data. Um, you know, obviously, the ball position can help you there a lot. Where do you think where are things stand in terms of tracking of the ball and in how you can use that to gain additional insight? Or is it really is the data really mostly used um, for tracking of the players at the moment? 
Well, I think, you know, it's improving every year. And like, even, you know, I started working with it about probably 2015, 2016. And even since then, we've seen improvements in kind of the ball tracking. Um, that being said, you know, there are certain data sources, like if say you have GPS data, you're not gonna have the ball. Um, say you have, even if you happen to have a, a, a sharing agreement where you have the GPS data for the opposition team, you wouldn't have the ball there. So you would have to rely on either manual tagging or just hope that the opt time stamps are kind of good enough to mm -hmm. let you know when the tracking data is occurring. And so with issues like that, you know, um, you have to build your model in such a way that it is robust against imperfect data and that's really what it comes down to a lot with tracking data is building in the uncertainty so that your model can still tell you useful things even when the data isn't perfect and i'd say the current state of ball tracking data is better but if you're trying to simulate say trajectories uh, you have to build in a lot of uncertainty there because the you don't have you know the spin of the ball you're not going to be able to get the proper curvature of tracks and you know for some situations that doesn't matter so much, but there's actually a lot of situations where that has an kind of a hundred percent error order of a magnitude effect in my experience, where like, if you don't have the, the spin, you're not gonna be able to figure out where that ball is actually likely to go. So you have to build your kind of tactical models with that information, with that lack of information. Yeah, just can I, can I, getting very excited very by quick. the idea of, of measuring ball spin. <laughs> Sorry, Javi. No, 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 please, please. No, I, I just wanted to add uh, something that is that uh, I think what uh, what what Will said is, was, is completely right. I mean, it's, it's a very good uh, approach on how to, I mean, the limitations that that data uh, also has. And uh, if you work with tracking data, it's way more, you know, it's bigger source of data, but then you probably, it's, it's not, it's not going to be that large in number of games. So you're going to have those issues. So. I'm saying that uh, in the end, you want to solve a question from someone in, that is in, in football practice. So uh, I know everyone is trying, you know, asking for tracking data and trying to get that. And it, it makes sense. It's really hard to get it, but probably something applicable that you might do and is even more practical and even uh, easier to communicate is, for example, trying to integrate event data with video. And I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very like, intense and, and always talking about video because in the end video is the closest type of data we have uh, to the reality of football and still you're going to lose things you're going to miss uh information there but um when you actually integrate uh, event data uh with video the first thing that you can do is validate that the, the kind of models you're building on even even the the, the simplest things actually are actually working and then you're going to realize of things that the data has in the same idea that Will mentioned that uh, you might have like one pass in a moment, but in, in, in reality, players are actually celebrating a goal in the corner. If you take a look at goal kicks in event data, it's crazy. I think 75% or uh, I don't know the actual number of goal kicks are wrong in the time and location of, you know, of event data, because many of those are captured watching a TV broadcast. And uh, in goal kicks, I mean, when, while the goalkeeper is taking the ball and trying to take the goal kick, TV is typically showing, you know, the replay or, or something extra. So people that is tagging that, what they have is actually, you know, they, they just have to guess where the ball was and the timing and the location is terrible. So just saying, going to a practical side, if you get uh, an acceptable model and link that with video and are able to, tell, to, to provide to a coach or to a game analyst, uh, practical information based on data that delivered in video form is going to be 100% more useful than just having some tracking data and trying to model the game and that thing that is typically being demanded. It's very interesting you say that because one thing that we've done at Hammerby is we've created a sort of augmented um, video. So when the coaches watch the match, or that was the plan for this season anyway, they'll have a part with the video then they'll have an expected goals map. They'll have a pass map. And they have lots of stuff. And we had we've got sort of five panels of data, and three of those panels are from event data, and only two of them are from from tracking data. So I, th I think that that gives you some balance of yes. of power between the the two of them. And even for me, who's most interested in in tracking data.
now I think you're you're the you're the chairman now, Laurie. So <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering. See, so um, I'll, I'll I'll go back to the um to my to my slides and see what. Maybe you could just read out the question. So um yeah, so like more of a sort of moving on to uh, kind of more technical questions about working with the data. So I mean. Obviously, the tracking data gives you the um, the positions of the players at any given instant, um, but that's still only a small amount of the information you're really interested in. And so, for example, if you talk the case of a of a player, a striker, um, uh, in he might be in two modes. He could have his back to goal, waiting for the ball to come to his feet, um, or he could be you know turning and accelerating towards you know to making a run in behind the defender for a through ball. If you just plot the position, um, both those cases are going to look largely the same at any given instant. Um, but of course, you know, so there, therefore, there's a huge amount of information in the um, in, in the derivatives, time derivatives of those that, that data. So, like the player's speed and the player's acceleration. And sort of given that, you know, football chances can be created, you know, in one or two seconds. Um, you know, being able to accurately measure these quantities, you know, would seem to be crucial in order to understand, you know, how a chance was created um, or the value the player is adding. Um, so, you know, maybe we could talk a little bit about sort of the questions about how you go about measuring, measuring these quantities. And, um, you know, given, particularly given that there's, as with all data sets, as particularly observed data sets, there's, 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 there's always some noise. So like, what's your, what are your techniques for kind of approaching measuring um, these quantities? I'll open it out to whoever wants to jump in on that first. Yeah, you hit on something I think really important there, which is kind of there's a lot of pre-processing that's required to really work with the tracking data in a useful way, um, especially if you're doing any sort of kind of physical modeling. Um, and I think you know what you're hitting on there is you've got to basically start with finding out the velocities of the players in the ball if you can, and to do that, if you just try to take the raw tracking data and you know it's 25 frames a second and you try to compute the velocity by taking the next frame and the current frame and subtracting those and dividing by the frame rate, um, you're going to end up with some really shoddy um, <laughs> velocities. Not only that, but it's going to be wildly different depending on your data source. So, you know, any noise um, in that, any kind of stochastic noise is going to be augmented and any um, Kind of snap to grid effects that some data sources have where it's uh, the, the data has clearly been discretized so you know maybe it's a meter resolution so the player will go from one meter one meter one meter two meter two meter two meter three meter three maybe three meter so that snap to grid will get augmented too so pretty much with any data source you have to start with smoothing um and there's obviously a number of approaches to that uh you know you can do like gaussian smoothing you can do savitsky gole there's all different ways to smooth that data um but once you have that smooth data, then you can start looking at higher order derivatives. But even kind of that, there's no like pretty much every company that provides tracking data, most of them who do it for football will do some sort of smoothing and do some sort of physical summary. And almost every single one has a completely different approach to it that gives completely different results. And so whenever you know you see a league switch uh, data providers, um, pretty much all of the sports science departments absolutely lose their collective minds because the data no longer agrees. And so you went from telling your, you know, the manager, oh, so-and-so, he runs about 10 kilometers every game to, well, he runs 12 kilometers every game now. Or, um, you know, usually the total distances are pretty close, but when you're looking at like high speed running or, or sprinting distances, those now vary sometimes up to like 100% differences when you switch providers. And so kind of having a good understanding of what you're doing to smooth and what you're smoothing, whether you're smoothing um, stochastic error, systematic error, um, or snap to grid error is, is really important, I think, um, if you're interested in those physical summary data. For tactical analysis, a lot of times you can get away with a lot less smoothing or you can do a bit less kind of work on that side, uh, which is nice because that's a lot of my work is kind of tactical. So when you're just interested in the locations of off-ball players, um, and things like that, and you're not necessarily looking at total distances for kind of um, uh, sports science purposes, then then you don't have to understand the type of smoothing you use quite as well. And you can kind of, as long as you're doing something sensible, you can kind of get away with whatever. At least that's my thoughts. Any 
Anyone else want to hop in there? I want to say some things, but I, I, I'm sure Sots wants to jump in. No? Yeah, sure. No, I just realized that I was on mute the entire time. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, to go back to your question regarding uh, how we would go about measuring kind of the effectiveness of these sort of positioning. Um, well, since I was on mute, I'd like to say a few other comments is one of the challenges that we have, and I'd like to touch upon what Will said, was one of the challenges we have with tracking data is trying to effectively understand energy expenditure in a proper way. So we want to try to be as non-invasive as possible with the players. So we don't want them to wear GPS devices, these sports bras, or any other devices for that matter. Um, but what we do find a lot of discrepancy between what we what we get from an accelerometer or GPS with what is provided in optical tracking. So um, from a sports science perspective, uh, tracking data is still not at the fidelity that we need to be able to understand um, fatigue and energy expenditure. And then the second aspect is maybe the challenge or an opportunity is um, getting this all real time. So I think it wasn't last year, but two years ago, Javier had someone come and speak around the data architecture around having uh, tracking data stored in a proper way. And Javier was speaking about having event data being matched with video. Um, it would be fascinating. It would be amazing to have uh, indexed tracking data that matches with indexed video. And that requires a certain type of data architecture. So it's not necessarily impossible, but it's definitely a challenge as one sort of philosophy that we have is that clubs are not necessarily technology departments. Um, so to sort out all of these infrastructure situations is a bit difficult. So, but to answer Lori's second question, I think it, it's really important to go back to basics and try to understand, well, what is the effectiveness of this forward uh, in this scenario? And I think the effectiveness of this forward is to cause some sort of disruption. And we can uh, calculate disruption very simply, even if we don't use pitch control models, we can control, we can calculate disruption just by looking at lines. So if you used uh, Jenks uh, natural breaks optimization, you can calculate lines of the, uh, of the opponent and try to understand, okay, these four players are in one line, these four players are the midfield line, these two players are the forward line. And then you can also just use relative distances between the players to just understand, okay, um, how much is this person's positioning actually drawing one center back away from another? And the way that we try to set thresholds is we try to then just use modeling around, well, when we stretch the two center backs uh, X meters apart, um, that leads to a 35 or 60% extra chance in getting a final third entry or a goal opportunity. And so um, a lot of the work that we do is primarily trying to understand how is our behavior creating a response that we want from the opponent, which is effectively just opening up space um, from a distance between a player's perspective, but also then you can get a little bit more advanced into pitch control models as well. I'm always very, I'm skeptical when I hear this claim. I mean, is, is the claim that you can measure with enough accuracy that you can, you can, find how much you've increased the chance of scoring by how you've you've moved a defender because I mean you need to do there's a learning problem there there's an identification problem there there's a lot of error there I can see the goal and it's a beautiful goal but how uh, is that how accurate is that is it accurate enough that you can really tell it to a coach 100% uh, behind it no, uh, so the thing is, um, the question really is when you try to put something on the training field, when you try to put something on the training pitch, this is a, this is a philosophical question that I think would be for another day is how accurate do we necessarily need to be when we mm. communicate insights to a coach or to a player? When we communicate, we don't, when, when we tell a player, if a, if a model says, even if it was the most perfect model in the world, and it says, ideally, we would stretch the two center backs 12 meters apart from each other to improve our goal scoring opportunity. Mm. Uh, the player on the field or the coach on the field is not taking out tape on the, on the field to measure out exactly 12 meters. Um, so we kind of communicate in orders of, um, Five or 2.5, or we communicate in orders of steps effectively. And steps might have some error to it, but steps are also a very easy way to communicate to a player, or to a coach, uh, to let them know like, hey, we should ideally want these people between 12 steps apart. And that's a little bit more easily visualized within a player's mind or a coach's mind. And so there might be some error in the model, but we're hoping that the, error, the correction of the error is done through the coach's domain knowledge. 
and through the way that we communicate, because we're not communicating in a very precise language. We need to communicate in a way that is easy for the coach or the player to understand. There's, uh, yeah, sorry, can I add something? Quickly, just, just seeing that there's uh, there's something I I think is, is very important um, to consider when we're trying to do models uh, that estimate probabilities, which is, 95% uh, of what we actually do. I mean, a uh, few of the people working on football will be interested in actually classifying if a pass is going to be correct or not, or if a given shot is going to be a goal or not. You actually want a probability or you want an expectation, but basically you want number in a continuous range, right? So going to a uh, little bit to David's question that uh, can you actually believe, or, or is, is that number actually accurate and, you're, and, you, and you feel comfortable to go into a coach and say, when this happens, then the, 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 you know, the percentage increment of probability of scoring a goal is 0 0.1, right? Well, a way of validating that is uh, calibration. So I'm going to, talk, I'm, I want to add something very little, I mean, very simple about, you know, uh, calibrating models and actually evaluating that. And I think one of the reasons, I guess, I'm, I really don't, don't know this for sure, of why we see from different companies so many expected goals model and they have so many differences is that probably you're training, you're adding lots of, infra, a lot of features to that model to try to get, for example, a good log loss error or whatever it's been used to measure that. But if we don't, do not measure probab um, probability calibration, we don't know if when the model says 0 0.3, it actually means that 30% of the times when a similar shot happens is going to be goal. So if you just pop, um, I mean, if you just put or plug in the, the data onto a more or less robust kind of algorithm like XGBoost that is now, you know, fashionable, uh, it's, it's going to provide something that looks like reality. But if you take a look at the calibration of that model, many times, if not every time, it's not going to look calibrated. And if you go further, like with EPV models that you have several of them, then they, not, they are not going to tend to look calibrated. So we have spent lots of time trying to calibrate models just to do something that the coaches ask us to do. That is, uh, we're not going to... I mean, what they say is we're not going to uh, criticize the, the technical approach you follow, but we need that you are 100% sure or that you are at least all the, I mean, 100% sure in, in terms of your knowledge that what you're providing is true. So one way, very easy way of actually validating that is calibration. And if you have, for example, now closing an expected possession value model, and then it tells you that certain pass is going to increase the probability of scoring in 0 0.05, uh, then you can actually validate that. The thing is that, of course, this is football. This is the average player doing the average pass in that average position. So that's also going to change according to players, but it's something that we can do from the modeling side that can really help to gain more security on saying, okay, this model is really uh, in the best of our possibilities, saying what is uh, something that is close to the truth, right? Yeah. So, so one question on that, I mean, when it comes to model building, you know, obviously, you, you know, have large quantities of data and, and you can kind of go about the approach of building up a model with a sort of a statistical model with parameters that represent the player's ability to do this, that, or the other. Um, or you can go, you know, there's another route, which is to sort of, throw all this data into in something like XG Boost or you know other machine learning models. Um, and you know often these are two very complementary approach. But how important is interpret interpretability of what your model is saying, you know, when it comes to like communicating your results. So you know if 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 a coach says why did your model tell you that this moment is important, yeah. you know, how do you go about explaining that? I think that's that's critical because I mean something that we get asked very frequently is what is the model taking into consideration to provide that is it, it is the model taking into account the, the location of off ball players the speed of players the angle whatever right so uh, we can be very tempted at just plugging in you know uh, variables that we can calculate with the tracking data or with the event data and say like yeah yeah the model is taking all this into account. 
But if you actually do not validate that, uh, the model might be having, you know, hundreds of features that just saying like, yeah, yeah, I'm looking at distance and angle because that's what I need, or I'm just discarding all, all the other things. So in order to be able to answer that, 100% the best way of starting with something is the simplest model as possible. Uh, linear regression models are gonna work more or less well to, to extrapolate in the most important uh, thing you want to measure there. And then you can fine tune those models or to see how can you improve that. But I mean, just providing an example, something that happened to me was, uh, we built a expected goals model with lots of data. And then I saw that uh, since there's, I don't know, 0.00%, 1% of shots in the first third, it's basically non-seen shots from there. Um, a model built, I think, was with XUBoost in that moment or with a neural network, just established that the standard value was 0.005% uh, probability percent of scoring the goal. So the model was basically saying be, behind uh, the, the, uh, the midfield is going to be you know, uh, 0.5% probability, which you actually will want the model to say it's zero. What, what happens there? The, the model is just getting very straight to the data it's seen. You're not input. I mean, you're, you're not plugging in data you haven't seen. Like you might actually provide data like these are shots that didn't happen, but we're very sure that if the, if the shot comes from, the, from my own corner, it's gonna be zero. So if you plug in that data, the model starts learning better things. You can actually validate that with calibration as well. But yeah, the simpler, the better. I completely agree with that. And you know, Javier already kind of touched on it, but knowing the ins and outs of the model you're choosing is extremely important because, you know, when you're just getting, when you're just starting to learn Python, you kind of got these 20 models that you can just import from scikit-learn. And as far as you can tell, they all kind of do the same thing. They all kind of give similar results. But, you know, if you're using a decision tree, um, that's going to give you a very, very kind of different sort of interpretability as say logistic regression. So like, you know, decision trees, a lot of times don't extrapolate as well to kind of unseen areas. Um, decision trees, K nearest neighbors, you know, these don't extrapolate well to kind of regions where you have very limited data. Whereas something like logistic regression is gonna extrapolate well, but it doesn't deal with kind of nonlinearities as effectively unless you add in higher order terms. So knowing kind of the fundamentals of the model that you're using and which sort of regions it's gonna work well in, and then possibly kind of building up from there. So uh, being able to dig into very simple models like logistic regression has weights. You can look at those weights. You can see if those weights make sense. You know, Does your logistic regression expected goals model have a negative weight for distance? If not, what something's going wrong? Does it have a positive weight for you know whether or not something is from a, the penalty spot? Um, you know, You can look at different things to see kind of how it's working. And if your model is, is uh, is learning kind of over over learning to veer various weird parts of the phase space that, that you're training it on. Mm -hmm. So I would say you know deep learning is extremely powerful, but if you haven't built kind of three or four simple models to answer the same questions first that you understand really well, um, you probably shouldn't be using a deep learning model. Yeah, I think that point just can't be overemphasized enough. I think it's so tempting to throw everything you've ever to model and, and get some answers out of it. But it really is about first, you should build the model as you understand that football works and you use deep learning or whatever other tool to learn a few things about it. I mean, I see data scientists like beating themselves up over that they put in these false data points for shots that never happened and have never been scored. But that's exactly what you have to do. You have to just cheat in some way. You cheat in the machine learning way, but you get the answer correct because you act, you understand about football, which a machine will never understand because you're never showing it those those things. So that's yeah. I really I really love both of your your comments your comments on that. It's fantastic. And just to build on that, I mean, how would it... oh sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, just to piggyback off on that, it's just really easy to kind of start simple and build up from there. So, you know, like in the Beyond Expected Goals paper, you know, you have a, a value model, which is literally just a one parameter exponential. You know, it's clearly... Yeah, that, that, I was thinking of that. I mean, that was you. I was laughing at that with somebody the other day, actually, your model of 
yeah. your expected possession value model is just yeah the distance to the goal and exactly. that works yeah. quite it well actually, actually well exactly and that's the thing is before you add in 30 parameters see how far you can get with one first and then mm -hmm. when you start building that model up you can see actually how it's helping you um you can see the ways in which it improves things rather than just starting complicated and then trying to figure out why your complicated model is broken somehow just to jump on that question improves i mean so how do you measure improvement so you've got a base simple baseline model that's like you know one parameter and then you're building more complex models on top of it is it prediction you know what is your assessment of you know, why one model is better than another yeah and i would very rarely i mean i think the the data scientist answer is your log loss goes down but i would almost never give that answer because i don't think that's a good answer like we don't like Javi is saying, we don't really care about log loss in this situation. What we care about is calibration and we, we, we care about kind of the, the, the football interpretability. So with that, you know, beyond expected goal sort of thing, like in that paper, we're kind of looking at um, the sorts of off ball scoring opportunities that different players um, are creating. And one thing you'll see from that is there's a lot of positional bias and so you then have to ask yourself the question, like, is that positional bias expected? Um, you know, would you expect? And so I think what was happening in that paper is actually fullbacks tended to look like they had fairly high, you know, off ball scoring opportunity because the, that exponential isn't capturing kind of the probability of scoring from outside the penalty area very well due to the fact that it's not taking into account the location of defenders. Um, so, you know, that model was at that point breaking down and you're kind of seeing it in the positional bias in that paper. Um, and so that's a situation where, you know, maybe um, you could add a few parameters that would improve that model that, yeah, it might lower the log loss. It may not even do so, but it would help make the kind of the tactical interpretation make more sense. So for me, that's kind of what it boils down to is I don't want to add any information to a model unless it's going to make the tactical interpretation make more sense. Yeah, also saying, saying something very quickly is that uh, something, I mean, what, what I always tell to some to people that starts working with us is it sounds not very, you know, pleasant, but, but I always say like, are you, are you ready for working, you know, weeks and months on something and then presented that and in one minute get someone telling you yeah that's not going to work that's what it actually takes so imagine that you take the most uh, complex approach to try to build something because this is the really uh, the good way of capturing that and we talk about a lot of spatial temporal modeling but i, I think only one percent of what's been done is actually modeling space and time fully you you, you are trying to discretize that a, a little bit to be able to solve something in a human time. So it's it's way more, um, I mean, it gets you more on the conversation uh, with the with the football experts if you're able to do what Wills does uh, or, or, or said that you build a simple model, you're trying to get there. Is this what you're trying to ask? No, I wasn't actually worried about that. I was worried about that second thing, but I'm not gonna tell you exactly what I'm worried about because we need the conversation to actually get to the important things. So that's the power of simple models. The thing is that of course, this, this, this is football and we always going to miss important information. So it's important to know what you are, are, are you trying to measure. And the second thing is, um that we cannot solve all the all the possible questions perfectly with one model and that's something we always feel tempted to say that the model really really takes into account 100 things and it's 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 so good it typically it's not in the sense that a football expert can spot the differences or what is not valid very quickly you want to get in a fast conversation and want to be able to solve questions very quickly. And for that, simple models are quite better. If you, if, if you then realize that that's something important that you need every week or that you, you really need to refine, then you can work on that uh, more strongly. I can provide a, a qualitative measurement of if the model is improving. I, I wholeheartedly agree in these simple models because effectively, um, the entire club is learning football all over again, in a sense. Um, and the thing is, is coaches may not want to admit it. And I might not want to say this because it's going to be on record, 
but uh, we're all going through a re-education of the game. And the re-education of the game for me is uh, like a good job that I, I feel like if I do a good job is more sticking with, okay, I'll use nonlinear methods for trying to understand spatial value. Um, but using simple tracking data and using simple events, you can get by with a lot of general linear models and using fixed and random effects. And that's a very easy way to explain something to a coach and explain point estimates and explain standard error in a way that a coach will actually understand and explain variability between players or variability within one player. Um, and so for me, what I feel is a mo like for me, what I feel is a measurement of success is actually a coach actually having a better understanding of what's going into this model to begin with. Um, because they had that understanding in footballing language, but then when they start to have that understanding with respect to a modeling language, even though they might not say it in that way, um, that's when I feel like the model is actually doing what it needs to be doing is because at the end of the day, it's going to be him with on the training ground with the players. And so explaining how each of these different factors are improving some sort of dependent variable, uh, will go a long way. We'll go a long, long way. Yeah. And um, I think a lot of times, you know, the, the context of the question is super important. So like one of the models that I kind of look back on um, was like a passing, the physics-based passing model, where basically you're simulating kind of the passes trajectory. And early in that process, I realized that by not including information about which team a player was on, the performance of the model was much worse. And that's simply because the tracking data doesn't, isn't perfect. And, you know, if there's a bias when a player selects a given pass, you know, like if I choose to make a specific pass, I know something about the body orientation of the players on my team that isn't visible in the tracking data. And so if you let that be a parameter of your model, you'll see that there's kind of a higher control rate for players on the same team as the player who, you know, did a pass then on the other team, which sometimes is interesting and sometimes isn't because, you know, if you're looking at like an expected passes above or below, um, you know, actual passes, then you might want to include that so that there's not consistent bias between say players who attempt 200 passes a game and players who attempt 15. Um, and so the, the question you're answering, you're trying to answer makes that very relevant. Like if you're just looking at um, you know, expected passing versus baseline, then you would want to include that parameter. If you're looking at kind of um, objective control, not take into account who is, um, who was in control, then you may not want to include that parameter. So the sort of question you're answering is going to heavily influence the sort of model you use, even when you're using the exact same model. Also, I like, I like a lot that about uh, you know the orientation and something that can be uh, you know hidden and you're not actually seeing uh you know that the like the what is considered to be like true learning is you know reinforcement learning in, in the sense of you know providing like an, an agent that knows nothing and try to explore an environment and trying to learn from that and that's like the, the best possible start from a for a matching learning model to actually try to learn Theoretically, the, the thing is that, I mean, now that we talk about the data sources we need to capture things, there's something extra that is what is there, but the data cannot tell you because the players already know. And we have talked about, about that in the past. That is, uh, when you think on a past probability model, we, we, we were building this model and it wasn't able to capture as well as I thought it should, that you basically do not pass on the location of your opponent is like, but players know that because we're basically getting data from professional players and they acknowledge that very easily and they know they're, they're not going to pass straight to the location of an opponent. But actually, uh, when you input the data to the model, it, it's basically not having that knowledge. It's, it's, just, it's just observing that sometimes the pass gets intercepted. So in the location of the opponent, it's not that good. So. If you, if you get that football knowledge and uh, augment the data a little bit and try to provide that information to the model, you can improve the model considerably. For example, adding passes, you know, making our passes saying, okay, these uh, are passes straightly directly to the location of an opponent. 
there was no one near, this is going to be a mispass. I know that's probably not correct for a you know, very scientific point, point of view, but it's going to improve the model from an applied perspective. Uh, and sometimes that's some extra thing we, we, we are missing, not the data we need, but the prior information or knowledge players have that we are not uh, you know, providing to the model beforehand. And I think that's fascinating. And it's, it's just a general limitation of machine learning. What machine learning is very good at is looking, is finding very obvious patterns. And what you're saying there, and, and that happens a lot, is when you try to train a machine to learn something, it will find something which is completely obvious to you. And it will find nothing that is of interest to you because the things that are of interest to humans are the things that aren't obvious or the more subtle things. And I think that's just a fundamental limit. And every time you see somebody who's trained up, you know, a neural network to do this, Google are working on football now as well. I think that there, there's going to be a long time until that sort of pure approach can have any sort of competition with, with somebody who's working with the human knowledge as well. Well, I, I have to say I'm doing things with neural, neural networks for, for my PhD. So when I publish that, probably this, this, this video is going to come up and say, like, what about the simple models, <laughs> right? So um, I'm asking for forgiveness right away, but we're trying to take the advantage of what those other kind of uh, learning uh, uh, procedures can actually be providing as an extra thing. But yeah, it's, it's a very good point, David. Yeah. I think being very sort of devil's advocate here, it's very interesting that Will uses a very simple model for EPV for the expected position value. You use a more simple ball model and you both feel comfortable with that. And there's a kind of bias there in what you're fundamentally interested in and then everything else, oh, it's just a trivial straight line. Let's, let's remember that the, that, that paper is now three years old. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so one of the big resources that you, you, you have, and you know, you've touched on it in different ways is um, you've got this kind of domain knowledge of the coaches like right next to you. And, um, you know, like thinking about one of the projects we were working on sort of over the last year is trying to figure out, like, take a possession sequence, like what phase are you in a possession? Um, and, you know, I know that coaches like to sort of break down possession phases into like, this is transition and this is like when we're trying to consolidate possession and this is when we're trying to score a goal and, and these kind of things. And, you know, you know, when we try and do this, like, is as an academic group, we sort of think about what rules can we put down or what can we learn from the data, but you can, you know, just kind of get the analysts to, or the coaches themselves to sort of say that this is the way we think about this. To what extent do you try and incorporate that information into the models you build, either by like training them or, you know, setting priors on parameters or in whatever way you can? From my side, I think it's, it's, I mean, we, we input that all the time because that's the first question we are going to get is like, okay, is this taking into account the actual context and context um, evaluation or trying to make up or to create features that talk about context is, uh, if not 40% of what we do, I mean, uh, if I can split our work in, uh, you know, in terms of 100%, probably 30% is trying to understand context better and the other 30% is to try to tell what's relevant and what is just an, another number, right? To try to explain when you have stats and say like, yeah, this, this is high and this is relevant because, and that because typically is because in this context, uh, what is useful, uh, I mean, uh, what is typical is that this happened, but this player is increasing that uh, uh, very highly. So that's becoming relevant for some reason. Uh, the thing is that actually the, the, the way uh, Barcelona sees a football model is not structuring interfaces, it's not splitting the game, but actually seeing a dynamic flow that is around the ball. So we, we, we have to balance those things that the way we're trying to approach football from a football pr perspective is not uh, square and it's not dividing things, but we need actually to do that in order to not add in so much noise when we're trying to communicate things. So it's probably a bit different from what is uh, typical, uh, but it's very interesting because we also get lots of very good inputs that are, you know, ball centric and you start understanding that not because you're closer to the opponent goal, you're doing things better. Uh, and you can use that, but basically saying that 
inputting contextual uh, information or trying to understand what context means in different moments for us is, is so important. And I think is uh, it was lacking a little bit from football analytics now to have more established way of saying like, okay, how do we establish context now so we can compare players? Because otherwise the forwards and the wingers and the attacking midfielders and creative players are, are going to get all the credit all the, all the time if we're just looking at scoring goals. I think I, I was thinking a bit about the paper we wrote for Sloan last year and uh, or yeah, this year, actually, and um, this zonal model. So what was fun about that is that I've worked previously with fish and we always talk about the zones of interaction of fish. And then it turned out that the zones of interaction, the way Barcelona think about these different zones of interaction is very similar that there's a there's a zone where you keep the ball there's a zone where you mutually help each other and then there's a sort of cooperation zone and you could start to think about football in a really different way than thinking about tactics and formations you just start to think about these zones and think about what you do in different zones and so i think that's informed a lot of the way that we've been working in hammerby actually is we've we've seen that our role um, as analyst tends to be about the third zone, the, f the zone that's furthest away. Hmm. How should you establish pitch control in those types of areas? So there's a sort of feedback backwards and between the coaches who want to define rules for these zones, and they allow us to have some impact on on how we how we use those zones. Mm, interesting. Hmm. That's almost like preempting what's going to happen in two or three seconds' time when the ball gets moved away from one area to another. Yes, exactly. And that's where pitch, I, I always see, see pitch control as a sort of one of the big things in, in the zone that you want to, we looked at this maximizing pitch control times pitch impact. Uh, you're not on the ball. And then we, we actually came with, and this is something I talked a lot to Stefan Bilbao, the manager about, is like when we're attacking in the final third, we're going to lose the ball. Where should we position the rest of the players? And then we could actually use pitch control to work out a good positioning so that we can get the ball back quickly if we lose when we're attacking in the final third. And I guess that brings up the kind of question of like, what is exactly the optimal or the best thing that you could be doing? Um, because, you know, once you have like a quantification of something, you can try and figure out how to get to, how to maximize something or minimize something and say like, mm -hmm. this is what we did. This is what we think would have been optimal. And is that, are those the kind of insights that you find that like the, the coaches and the players you work with can take action on and sort of learn from? Not sure how, how close we are to exactly that. I mean, when uh, I put one of the videos up on the channel about just explaining expected goals, get closer to the goal before you shoot. That's the sort of possibly the level we're at communicating from our point of view, but eventually I, re I really, I, I do actually believe that. And, that's for me personally that's one of the goals is to is to really be able to influence what happens tactically or how how they think about their positioning and so on and we have players now who do actually we have a defender who says that he sees pitch control um when he's playing that he, he he's seen the videos and he thinks about how he's going to occupy space by thinking from that bird's eye view above him. And I think that's a really, that's a really nice result when they can actually use these mathematical ideas visualized to decide what the, how they're going to play. Yeah. I, th I think there's, there's something about football that is definitely, it's not a game about optimizing just uh, the goal scoring chance. So that makes very complicated to actually say what's the optimal action in mm. every moment, right? So <clears throat> something we, we have been plotting is actually using this spatial EBV model in which you can say, what's, the, what's the, the, the potential added value of any possible pass when a player is in possession of the ball? You can see uh, the actual EBV you have now, but also potential uh, EBV in case you will take this or the other pass. The thing is that how to tell when those potential passes are the optimal. They're always going to be suboptimal. And the thing is that, uh, at least in our game model, we need to move the, op the opponent around and we need to change the speed in the way the ball moves um, 
around so we can gain an optimal or, or very high value suboptimal po uh, potential pass. The thing is that what our players get, get so good at doing is identifying that. Like, I know I have an opportunity there, but I'm not gonna pass yet. I need to move the ball a little bit more around because the actual better opportunity is coming. And the second thing is that when you're winning and you don't want to lose uh, the match, for example, or you don't want to get a goal against, probably the optimization problem changes, right? Maybe you want to have possession of the ball as closer as possible to the opponent's goal, but not actually losing the ball. So the tricky thing about football and actually identifying optimal actions is, for, for me is that, what are you trying to optimize? And then you have a final layer that is, what are players in that level, that is so high level, uh, capable to do or willing to do in different situations? You, you, you might say the optimal movement now is the right back running behind the defender lines and then putting a pass there in, into space. You might say, yes, but the guy having the ball now cannot do that or is not the best player doing that and the right back's not gonna run there. That's a possibility. So it's complex. <laughs> I feel, have you, have you been through all your, uh, sorry. No, no, I, no, I was just going to say that I, I think relative to that, uh, we're not looking yet into um, what is the optimal decision. Uh, decision making, I think, is a framework uh, that would require much more than 35% of my time. <laughs> but um, what we do want to look at, and one thing that we can optimize with tracking data and it should be a priority is just re refactoring and restructuring player ratings. Um, so we have a game model in mind. Um, so the first step should always just be, can tracking data be used for evaluating what is your game model? Um, what is your game model in these different phases of phases of play? And then can we actually construct player rating values that are consistent with the coach's philosophy and consistent with the club's philosophy? At the moment, a lot of uh, player rating models are out there and available to use, um, but they're not necessarily finely tuned for what our game model is. Mm -hmm. And so that's just one, one aspect of what we could look at. Uh, it doesn't, again, and these player rating models aren't necessarily looking at what is the optimal action that they could have done relative to what's happening right now. So using the live context of what you see in tracking data, but rather what is the optical, what was the optimal solution given the ideal game state of our game model? And that in itself provides a lot of value. So all this is fascinating. I'm slightly worried that no one is watching anymore because uh, I don't know if anyone <laughs> looked to see if this is really fascinating discussion. But um, did you, has, have we gone through all of your points, Laurie? Uh, we got sidetracked a long time okay. ago. Actually. Well, <laughs> we were meant to talk for 45 minutes or something. Now we're, I don't know, speaking for an hour and a half. And I always say that I have to go to bed at 10 o'clock. So um, I think I'm going to round things up and we've still got loads and loads of things to talk about. So, and it's been great having you here tonight, Will, and I hope we can have more of you here on some other occasion. Would that be a possibility? Sounds good. Okay, and you'll certainly be seeing a lot of Laurie on the videos the coming, the coming weeks. And Suds, you also have, um, oh, look at this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually put it while I speak. I'm going to put up, um, I'm going to, put up Totti's thing here. Yeah, there we go. So um, we're going to have, um, during the week, Laurie's going to be putting up a couple more lectures, starting up with the tracking data. And there's two matches there you've got of tracking data and you're going to talk about analyzing them. Yep, and Will and as well. Will's going, going to, to do a, yeah. Will's, Will's going to be in that as well. So the two of you are going to do some videos on that. Uh, then Suds, you have, Already recorded, I've heard, a follow-up to your R thing. Yep, uh, so it'll just be um, creating a shiny uh, application in R to be able to identify XG opportunities based on assist zones. Cool. And then, Javier, you and uh, Fran are planning some sort of extravaganza of uh, pitch control and um, EPV and so on in the future. Yeah, I think it will be more about what actually will say that why not make an, a simple model? So our pitch control model is not even learning from data. It's just lots of assumptions to try to get as quick as possible 
to evaluate a pitch control. And then a good question about that is, what is pitch control about after all? Because that's even a question we haven't uh, even, I mean, it's, it's not like a standard, there's not a standard answer for that. It's about controlling the ball, it's about influence. So we basically want to talk a bit about influence model and how you can measure different levels of influence from one player to, to the other that, that I think is more interesting to add more than what is already being said about actual pitch control. Well, that's fantastic. And these these uh, these pictures are fantastic. I'm really glad we've got the notes because I can hardly remember half of the things that we've, uh, we've covered in this um, in this this session. Uh, I think I'll just wait. Speak of you. Yes, I need to put myself on speak of you to finish. Well, I can't find myself, so we'll, we'll leave the beautiful beautiful picture here and say. Thank you very much to all of you for coming on and such interesting and detailed discussions. I think uh, it was really technical, but for me was interesting. These sorts of things, I don't think I've ever had an in-depth discussion at this level with all of you guys. So this was really fantastic. Thank you very much. And we'll be back next week. We are still organizing exactly who we're going to have for guests, but certainly a group of us will be here and we'll be discussing another, another interesting topics in football analytics. Thank you very much for this evening. Thank you, David. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.